All right. Uh, last week, last week we talked about the mark of true Christianity, and the mark of true Christianity can be like proven by controlled speech. And today I want to talk about two different uh, characteristics of true mark of Christianity. And the second one that I want to talk about today is a living. An active love for those who are in need. So let's look at James chapter 1, verse 27. James 1, 27. It says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. The religion that God accepts is sacrificial love for those who are in need. And James said to visit orphans. James said to visit orphans and widows. See, visit implies not only going to see these people, but also caring for them. And it is also present tense. That means this should be the habit of one's religious life. So last week, James is saying, if you truly believe in God, then you need to reveal your heart. And the one of the, the, the area that has to be manifested in Christian life is that, that we speak carefully. And today, James is saying, you truly believe in Jesus, then you have to prove it with your life. Reaching out to those people who are in need. And you need to visit them. Once again, not just going to see them, but to care for those people. And it is present tense, meaning that it has to be ongoing. You need to do it not only once in a while, but it should become your lifestyle. In the Old Testament times, the orphans and the widows were the most helpless people. In those days, there was no insurance for widows or kids. So if a husband, who's most likely a dad, if he passes away, if he dies, the wife and kids had no one to look out after them. Yes, after the harvest, or maybe even during the harvest, a little portion of the field had to be left alone for widows. But still, it was extremely <coughs> difficult for, for them to continue the living. The widows and orphans were the most helpless people in those days. How about today? Who are the hopeless, ah, not hopeless, helpless people today? And I think asking so-called WH words can help us to think a little bit more deep of identifying who they are and how we can help them. So what's WH words? Who, what, when, where, and how? And did I miss anything? Who, what, when, why, where, and how? Six? That's enough, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's enough. And just asking those questions, we can go a little more deep. So who are the helpless people today? And where are they? And what can we do for them? And when can we help them? And why are we to help them? And how can we help them? So who are the helpless people today? I think not all, but still. Widows, single mom, and orphans are the most helpless people today. And who else are helpless people today? And what can we do for them? You know, I think helpless people could be <clears throat> who are capable of working, but who are struggling temporarily. Maybe he got just fired, and maybe he's having a hard time finding a new job. And maybe they are helpless people right now, and we can help them. <clears throat> We can help them finding jobs and refer them to people that we know who own a store or a company. And I help them to find a good job. Or help that people could be elderly people, men and women who don't have family living near them to help them. So we can give them rides, and if they don't speak English, then we can help them and translate for them. The helpless people could be a family who is struggling with sickness. We can give them a ride 
to a hospital, we can shop for them, we can take care of their kids if they have one. Also, the helpless people could be a single mom with young kids. We can help with chores as, such as like giving a ride, cooking for them, and helping with their homework. And helpless people could be homeless people. And I read one article and this, this author is giving us just four practical things that we can do for them. First, volunteer. So like Portland Rescue Mission or Women's Shelter. You know, we can go there once in a while to you know, help them serve food. So we can volunteer the, this work. And also, second thing that we can do for the homeless people is we respect them. And the author says, when you talk to them, look into their eyes. <laughs> look into their eyes. Show that you really care for that person. And third thing we can do is we can give, but with love. We can give with love. Don't make them feel embarrassed. Don't hurt their pride. And the last thing we can do for them is that we can pray for them. We can pray for them. So, where are they right now? Where are the helpless people? You know, they are everywhere, including our church. Look around this room. We can see people who need our help. Look around KN. Look around our CS and YG. Pay attention to our kids. Talk to them. Listen to them. And try to find out if there's any need that, that we, can, we can provide for them. Look around this city. Beaverton, Hillsboro, downtown Portland. Look around. There are so many people who need our help. And we need to pay attention to who are helpless. And we need to be prayerful to see what we can do for them. And if you read the Bible, we cannot ignore what Jesus did. Can anyone go outside for a minute and uh, talk to I a little bit? If you read the Bible, we cannot ignore what Jesus did. Jesus spent lots of time with those who were in need, especially those who were sick, and he went out of his way to help them. So also, do you remember what Jesus said about those who helped people in need? Let's look at Matthew 25, 35 to 40. Matthew 25, 35 to 40. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and close you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. One thing one said this, The point of this parable is not the who, but what. The importance of serving where service is needed. Jesus' original intent seems to be that how we treat, uh, how we treat lowly and needy fellow Christians determines how truly we love Jesus. But now here's a, a key question here. Why is James, why is James connecting helping the helpless people to pure religion? Think for a minute. James is connecting, helping the helpless people to pure religion. Is helping the helpless people that important? Another theologian said this, pure and faultless religion is not perfect observance of rules and observances. Instead, it is, it is a spirit that pervades our hearts and lives. 
It's not just about obeying the law, but letting the word of God completely transforming us, transforming us so that we will obey God out of love for God. You know, just like last week's message on the tongue, true religion, true Christianity has to be proved by action. So James said, you are saved, then prove it with your speech. And here today, James saying, are you saved? Then prove it with your hands. Prove it with your hands. Act. Help those people who are in need. Now God said he loved us and he showed us the love. Let's look at Romans chapter 5 verse 8. Romans 5 8. But God shows, and different translation, like NIV said, but God shows or demonstrates his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And as we can see from this passage, and from the life of Jesus on earth, He did not, Jesus did not just talk about love. Jesus demonstrated His love for us. He literally came, and He lived, and He died for us. He didn't just talk about love. He did not just say, I love you, but he showed that love. So once again, James is saying this, you believe in Jesus, then prove it. Demonstrate. You know, non-Christians will most likely, I'm not saying they will never, but most likely they're not going to read the Bible. We have to read the gospel too. We Christian, we have to read the gospel to Remember Dr. Swiss that I talked about last week? This is what he said. We're not going to persuade people of doctrine unless it shows in our lives. The most persuasive thing for the gospel is a transformed life. And Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 said this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 to 3. Paul says, You yourselves are our letter of recommendation, written on our hearts to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human heart. Paul said, we are the letters from Christ. Isn't it amazing? We are the letters. Our life is the letter from Christ. So whether you realize or not, whether you like it or not, whether you are aware of it or not, your life is being read by people around you. They're not just looking at your life, but they're really actually reading the gospel. They're actually reading the Bible from your life. And what kind of gospel do you think people are reading from your life? Gospel means good news. Gospel means good news of Jesus Christ. And are people around us reading the good news of Jesus? Or are they reading a fake news of Jesus? Once again, whether you realize it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you are aware of it or not, people are looking at your life, and they're going to find about who Jesus is from your life. James chapter 2, verse 14 to 17. James said this, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also by faith, if it does not have words, is dead. John also says something similar. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17 to 18. But if anyone has the world's good, and see his brother in need, yet close his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, 
Let us not love in word or talk, but in, but in deed and in truth. James and John and Jesus, they all said, Do you really have faith in God? Then prove it with your life. Don't just talk about loving them, but demonstrate, prove it. Show what is in your heart. In a lot of what James and John said, we're not pure in terms of obeying God. And I'm going to ask you a question, and let's be honest. Are we poor? Are we helpless? You know, like the widows and orphans in the Old Testament and New Testament days, are we skipping every other meal? Are we eating just a, you know, one meal in just every two or three days? No, we eat sometimes too much. Are you naked? Are you without a winter jacket? Are you without a rain jacket? Are you without shoes? And actually, we have so many clothes. So many different shoes to wear. Depends on what skirt you wear, what pad, what color you wear. And the other day, I came across a survey reporting that the Average American man, do you, do you know how many pair of shoes American men own? You own? <laughs> average in America, guys, average 12 pairs of shoes. How about women? Wow, 27 pairs, <laughs> average. So, the national average for American. You and me, we own 19 pairs per person. So I looked at the survey, so I counted my shoes. Wow. I'm not going to tell you how many. <laughs> wow. Well, my answer was, wow. <coughs> Please go home and count. You know, we live with too many stuff, and yet, instead of helping out those who are in need, we think we are helpless and we think we are poor and we cry out to God for more stuff. Isn't this true? Definitely, this is impure religion or James says, that is impure Christianity. Let's be practical. Don't get offended, but I want you to ask yourself, how much did I spend last month or this month for those people who are in need, how have I helped the helpless? When have I helped the helpless? Where have I helped the helpless? You know, we have a few college students here, and I'm not just picking on you, college students, but I'm just picking on you guys because you guys are the youngest. <laughs> I know your number one excuse is, I'm just a student. I don't make money, I don't have money to spare to other people. Fine. Then have you used your time to help those who are helpless? <clears throat> so many college students say, I'm a student, I need to study, I don't have time for other people. Fine. Then have you prayed for the helpless people? Now let's now come up with another excuse. No matter how poor you are, no matter how busy you are, no matter how sick you are, there's something we all can do to help out the helpless people. And as I told you earlier, at least we can pray for them. What makes up your prayers? Let's be honest. Does your prayer mostly revolve around you and your family. Doesn't your prayer, full of asking for more of your needs, actually your want, your desires, not your real need, but your want? It's time to truly pray for those who are in need, physically and spiritually. You know, today, we need to really remember that we were helpless that all of us, we were helpless spiritually in our sins. That we were all heading 
towards the eternal death. But Jesus Christ, He demonstrated His love for us. He did not just talk about loving us, but He came in and lived, fulfilled all the love for us. And He died on the cross to save us. Because we were helpless, because there was nothing we could do to save us, He did it for us. And we as Christians, let's not just talk about loving other people, but let's truly show it with our lives. That's the true mark of being a genuine Christian, God said. So the first mark of being a true Christian is that we have a controlled speech. The second one is that we give our hand to those people who are in need. And what's the third mark of true Christianity? It is a pure personal life. Let's go back to verse, chapter 1, verse 27. James 1, 27. Religion that is pure and undefined before God, the Father, is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And third, to keep oneself unstained from the world. The third mark of true Christianity is a pure personal life. How do you keep your life pure? How do you keep your heart pure? It's a very important thing, the question that we need to ask as a Christian living in this 21st century. Let's look at Psalm 119, verse 9 to 11. It says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandment. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin. The author of this psalm said, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. You know, when someone visits my family from Southern California, the first thing they say about my kid is that they grew so much. But for me, because I see them every single day, I cannot really tell whether they grew or not. But when I look at the pictures that were taken right before we moved up here, then yes, they truly grew a lot. I think I grew too. Man, I got a little bit old, but I, I grew. Anyways, I don't know how people grow. I don't know how people grow. I don't know anything like metabolism, reproduction of cells, like hormone balance. And about this kind of science and what's involved with the how human grow, I don't know much about science. But one thing that I know about growth is that people need to eat well, rest well, exercise well, and sleep well. Am I am I correct? Yes. Am, I, am I correct? Absolutely. All right. So in order for us to grow, we need to eat well. You need to exercise, you need to rest, and you need to sleep well. I don't know what's involved with it, but if you do that, you will grow. And it is the same spiritually. I don't know how people grow spiritually. But if Christians place ourselves physically, physically, to the place where the Word of God can be read and heard, I don't know all the process, but I know we will grow spiritually. You know, it might sound so obvious, but this is what I realized on Friday morning during the morning prayer. You know, I came to the civic the, the, the more early morning prayer on Friday, and I was praying with this message, and this is the insight that God gave me. God said, you need to place yourself physically in certain situations to be the person you want to be. That means, if you want to grow, Spiritually, you need to place yourself physically near the Word of God. If you want to grow spiritually, then physically you need to place yourself physically. Your body has to be near the Word of God. Where the Word of God can be read or where the Word of God can be heard. Otherwise, whatever that is near your physical body, that will shape and that will mold your thinking and your lifestyle. 
And I want to ask you, what's around you? What's near you physically? Every day. Think for a minute. From the morning till until you go to bed. What things are around you physically? And what are you filling your heart with? Is that the word of God? Or is it materials? If you sit in front of a computer all day, looking at, go inside the Amazon, and looking at all these new gadgets, if the more you look at it, the more you want it. You go to Zappos.com, is it Zappos? You go like shopping, like online, look at all the dress, shoot, the more you look at it, the more you want it. It's not your needs, but you want it. And you're completely, your heart's completely consumed. What is the latest gadget, or shoes, or dress, etc., that you're completely consuming these days? How about TV, dramas, or movies? What are you watching these days? Do they influence the way you want to live? Do they influence the way you view this world? Do they change the way you define success, happiness, and goal? And can you come up right now, can you come up to the front right now and tell us what you are watching these days? If yes, then maybe it is okay. But if not, why not? Is it because it's something inappropriate? Does your wife know that you're watching that show? Mr. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <Mr>. Greg? <laughs> <laughs> and does your husband know that you're watching that show? Or movie or dramas? Does your parents know that you're watching that? And even if you're watching, even if what you're watching right now is, is perfectly appropriate, as like, such as like sports, but if that consumes too much of your time, to the point that you don't have time to read the scripture, you don't have time to worship God, and you don't have time for your family members, then you need to really evaluate and do something about it. What's really filling your heart? What are the foundations of your value? How important is money? Now check your bank statement. It will just show you what you're pursuing after. Where do you usually spend your money on? And if you were to sit with God, okay, with our Jesus, going over your bank statement, what would Jesus say to you? Will he say you are being a good steward? You're being a good manager? with the money that God has entrusted to you. What's filling your heart? What's physically around you? Who do you hang out with these days? Who are your friends? And what are their hobbies? And what do you guys do? Do you agree that you become more like the people you hang out with? We all imitate or be influenced by the people we spend time with. You know, as a pastor, if I spend lots of time with pastors of the so-called mega church, you know, church, and the pastor you know, who's doing a ministry with like thousands of people, man, sometimes I want to be like that. Man, I, I wish I, my church could be like thousands of people. I wish we could have a beautiful building. I wish I could have their salary. I wish I could have this and that. I want to be like that. Are you surrounded by people who are really challenging your faith? You know, last few years, lots of Korean movies related to North Korea were made. And all the actors and actresses, they practiced so hard to speak like North Koreans. But when I look at the movie, it's so awkward. They imitate, but it's not genuine. 
But my father is from North Korea. All my aunts are from North Korea. They have original accents of North Korea. And my father is a pastor. He retired, but my father is a pastor. And he speaks perfect Korean. But still, whenever he gives a benediction, of course, and he does it in Korean, and he usually begins with this word, Onulai, today. That's how it begins. But because he's from Korea, he cannot say Onulai. He says it in, in North Korean way, Onulai. <laughs> he cannot say it. Last, I don't know, like 20, 30 years of my life, every time I hear my dad giving a benediction, he can never say it today. It's like he's saying Todai. <laughs> okay. He can never say Onulai, it's so Onulai. See, my dad does not need to practice North Korean. Why? Because it's in him. It's in him. He automatically says, Gorom Gorom. You know what Gorom Gorom means? It's like, yes, yes, in, in, in North Korean. It just comes out naturally. He does not have to practice it. It's in him. You know, when we are dwelling in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we don't need to practice or pretend to be Christian. Just like James said, do you truly believe that what you say, the controlled speech will come out? If you're truly dwelling in the, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, helping hand will come out naturally. If you're always dwelling in the word of God, in the gospel, the pure heart will just come out naturally. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to pretend. Examine your heart. That's James' challenge too. The true mark of Christianity. It's not about just you know what we just present in front of people, but what truly really comes out from our lives. It is my prayer that we physically place ourselves near the Word of God, where we can read the Scripture and where we can read other, or hear the Gospel of Christ, and where we can meditate upon the Gospel of Christ. Let's bow our head. I want to give you just a couple of minutes to examine your heart. Are you physically near the world? Physically, what's around you? Who is around you? What are you filling your heart with these days? Is that the word of God or is that the world? Is that the word of God or is that material? Let's be honest before God. Let's examine our hearts. 